Donald Trump slams the judge in a San Diego lawsuit, and Hillary Clinton touts her foreign policy expertise. Candidates for San Diego City Attorney praise their own abilities, but what does that office really need? And voters are bombarded by a slew of negative, contradictory mailers for city council candidates. And Proposition H may offer a cure for San Diego's infrastructure backlog or not. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, reporter Steve Walsh at KPBS News. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Good to have you back again. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Mark. Glad you're here today. Reporter Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? Good to see you today. And reporter David Garrick, who covers the City Hall of San Diego for the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Dave. Hi, Mark. Good you're here today. Now, at his downtown San Diego rally last week, Donald Trump went after the federal judge handling two class action lawsuits against Trump University in San Diego. Here's the presumptive GOP presidential nominee attacking U.S. District Judge Gonzalo Curio. The judges in this court system, federal court, they ought to look into Judge Curio because what Judge Curio is doing is a total disgrace, okay? But we'll come back in November. Wouldn't that be wild if I'm president and I come back to do a civil case? Wild, there's the operative word there, Steve. Uh, <laughs> a lot of legal experts have expressed alarm this week over Trump's re remarks. He's been doing this all along. Why is talking about a federal judge this way seen as a problem? Uh, well, it's seen as a problem because he's called out the judge's uh, First of all, a Mexican, which he, he's not Mexican. And he's, born in uh, Indiana. He's right? actually born in East Chicago, not too far from, <laughs> from where, where I'm from, actually. Yeah. His parents are, uh, are immigrants from Mexico. But in calling out the judge's heritage, saying he's disqualified himself because he's uh, of Mexican descent, I think these are the things that are really... Uh, highlighting some of the yeah, concerns you start, over the statement. You start thinking about that. Would every uh, Caucasian judge be disqualified then on an issue that involved Caucasians, every black judge, etc.? I mean, where do you go with this? There's no logic to it. Um, so anyway, the, the key th thing, the big story this week was the Washington Post asked, and th this judge agreed and revealed a bunch of documents from the San Diego lawsuits. And this uh, dump of documents here, what did they uh, reveal? What were the high points uh, that they were revealed in this? Well, the high points is they went through uh, a series, they released a series of what they called playbooks, which basically the manuals for these courses here. So if you uh, signed up for this course, this is how you were supposed to be trained. People spent upwards of $35,000 for these courses. If you go through things like this sales playbook, um, uh, what they did, in very specifically, is they uh, they would find out people's credit ratings. They would find out how much how many credit cards you had out there, and then they would quickly start pressuring people to take more and more of these courses. And okay. The, and, and Trump's role in Trump, you, I mean, he was pretty heavily involved, wasn't he? Now? He was heavily involved in the sense that he was uh, he was the owner of this. This wasn't a licensee agreement. He was the owner of Trump University. But yeah, there were uh, several questions as to whether or not he was involved at all in the day-to-day -day operations, even though. Uh, in the sales pitch, they said that he was handpicking all of the yeah. instructors and was going to be heavily involved in the coursework. Right, and they're, they, they're showing evidence that that didn't happen. Now, what does Trump himself say about these claims? And they were made not just with the lawsuits here, but there's lawsuits elsewhere, and five attorney generals had to feel of these complaints in, in different states. Yeah, the New York attorney general is, is the big one there, uh, aside from these class action suits here in, in San Diego. Trump says that uh, he can point to signed cards from a lot of people saying that they, uh, um, they enjoyed the course, that they gave it five stars. Uh, after these allegations came out, he produced a couple of people who went through the course and said that they liked it and they thought that they had uh, benefited from it. Because but even those, some of those are yeah, backtracking. Even one now. of those yeah. is saying that uh, we're finding that he has some business dealings with Trump, so he might have mm -hmm. other reasons why. Right. And I, I heard a New York Attorney General the other day saying it's not uncommon in, say, Ponzi schemes for folks right up to the point where they realized they were duped to sing the praises of the folks. Right. The question would be, when did they sign that card? Did they sign that card uh, the first afternoon or after they spent $35,000. Now, Hillary has started to Hillary Clinton. That is, of course, the pres presumptive Democratic Oh, nominee, I wouldn't not say that. Quite, oh, we can't do and, that. Not before Tuesday. Not, not before Tuesday. She's, she's, she's in the lead. Anyway, anyway, the leader, let's say. She, right. She's been exploiting some of this Trump stuff on the, on the uh, stump. 
Indeed she has. In fact, she had uh, she made her first appearance here in San Diego on Thursday, uh, and she uh, basically touted her foreign policy credentials here. This was a speech that in many ways was uh, was not a primary speech, but a general election speech designed to you know, burnish her credentials on national security and attack Donald Trump at, for his perceived weaknesses. Go after the GOP nominee. Well, that's a beautiful segue. Let's go right into the bite we have from Hillary Clinton. Imagine if he had not just his Twitter account at his disposal when he's angry, but America's entire arsenal. Do we want him making those calls? Someone thin-skinned and quick to anger who lashes out at the smallest criticism. All right, as you say, it didn't mention Bernie Sanders there. She's going after uh, Donald right. Trump. Didn't but, mention him at all, actually, during yeah. that. But what are the polls uh, saying? What do we think might happen here on Tuesday with the, uh, the Sanders-Clinton race? Looks like it's very close. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a pretty interesting scenario where she loses California and yet still gets enough delegates to become the nominee anyway and kind of backs in complicates it, the narrative about right. what just happened. Right. And the t tables will turn a bit in, in 08 when she was running against Barack Obama, did well down the stretch, 7 out of 10, and of course still didn't get the But nomination. she clearly wants to win. She's canceled several events around the country. San Diego was the first of a five days' worth of campaigning. So she's going to be in California pretty much throughout. All right, last question before we move on. Uh, could this Trump flap and all the publicity out of San Diego and the judge and everything, would that have some bearing, do you think, on the, uh, on the uh, premier here on Tuesday regarding these two? Or the Trump San or the Sanders I, I, Clinton Isn't the UT saying straight. that people should vote for Ronald Reagan instead of Donald Trump? <laughs> right, right and wrong? Yeah, so, <laughs> no, I, so. I was at an event this week that uh, Francine Busby, the party chair, spoke at, and she said, you know, the two best organizers we've got going in San Diego County right now are Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. So uh, to the extent that Donald Trump has kind of been in the press and makes people recognize the differences between the two parties, maybe it does. And so that, as you're saying, the suggestion there is to get out the vote and then we'll see what impact it'll have on the rest of the races, which we're going to turn to now away from the, the national one. So San Diego City Attorney Jan Goldsmith is termed out and there are five candidates who want to replace him. With such a crowded field, it's probably unlikely any of them will get exceed the 50 percent on Tuesday, forcing a November runoff between the top two vote getters. All right, Andrew Bowen, let's do a quick rundown here on who's running four Democrats, one Republican. Um, give us kind of the uh, the thumbnail on that. Only one of them is in the office right now, Attorney Mara Elliott. That's working. right. So Mara Elliott is a chief deputy city attorney in the office right now. Uh, Interest, despite how that sounds, she's not the number two in the office. She's one of several chief deputies. Mm -hmm. uh, she has some background in public education, public transit. She worked for the county council's office. So uh, she you know, says, I have a lot of experience in municipal law, and that's what uh, this office really needs. Mm -hmm. She's also been in the office for quite some time, so she can say you know, what works well and what needs improvement. Uh, you have Gil Cabrera, another Democrat. He's uh, an attorney in private practice. Um, he also serves on the Convention Center Corporation Board. Uh, he's a judge pro tem, so he subs for judges in the Superior Court. And he's also uh, touting his experience as chair of the City Ethics Commission. He says, you know, you need an, an independent uh, city attorney who can speak truth to power and, and hold the public officials accountable if they want to do something that's illegal. Mm -hmm. um, Rafael Castellanos, uh, also an attorney in private practice. He works for a local real estate and business firm. Uh, he's also a port commissioner. Uh, and he says his experience in real estate law and land use uh, is going to be really helpful uh, as the city faces a lot of issues in that area, including the convention center expansion, stadium downtown, things like that. Um, Brian Peace was a late entrance to the race. He's um, uh, also a Democrat, and uh, he entered in January. He's a public interest lawyer. He's uh, made a name for himself in some free speech cases against the city, uh, also the La Jolla Seals issue. And then uh, the one Republican is Robert Hickey. He's a uh, a uh, deputy district attorney um, at the county level, so he leads the, the gang unit there, and um, he's running on that experience of enforcing the law, and especially as, as, as a lot of California felonies are downgraded to misdemeanors, he says that ex prosecutorial, prosecutorial experience is going to be really important. All right, so we need to take a nap now, just get yeah. through the candidates. <laughs> it's a crowded field, as we said. How do you uh, uh, sort these out if you're the, the voter there? I mean, obviously, you can read the background and the, uh, the, the thumbnail bios and all, but do endorsements matter more in a race like this because of the crowd in the field? I think so, and, and in large part because uh, a lot of people don't really know what the city attorney does. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the city attorney has three main roles. So they prosecute misdemeanors, they uh, advise the city council and city staffers and the mayor on different legal issues, and they uh, 
litigate. They, you know, when the city gets sued or when the city sues another party, that um, they're the ones that go to court or the office rather goes to court. Um, yeah, I think in this particular race, the endorsements are probably less important for Robert Hickey because he's the only Republican. And if you're a loyal GOP voter, you're going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Democratic side, I think that uh, the, the county Democrats didn't actually endorse anyone in this race. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's especially important for them because if you're a loyal Democratic voter, you might not know you know, which candidate most reflects your values. Now, Andy Keach, you did a story about a conservative, conservative Republicans trying to manipulate voters on the Democratic side in this race. Explain what they're doing. So, there, yeah, there was a, a mail piece that went out. There was actually a couple that, uh, that went to Democrats um, and was ostensibly in support of Bob Hickey. Uh, but the mail piece made it very clear and you know if it was an attack on the Democrats that it was purporting it didn't do it very well it kind of described them in terms that I think most Democrats would see as favorable um, and uh, it, this was kind of seen I guess you could say as a uh, an example of the Republican Party kind of trying to choose its opponent that, that it wanted to support this candidate that was seen as, for one reason or another, as the, the vulnerable candidate. And it, David? And it was Rafael Castellanos yeah. is the one that they selected. And, and conventional wisdom is that Hickey will be in a runoff against either Cabrera or Castellanos based on fundraising and donations. We don't know for sure, but yeah. Pease and Elliott are considered less strong candidates based on how much they raised. And it appears that the Republicans would rather face Castellanos in November than Cabrera. Not and, sure why. Uh, I, I have an idea. Well, I asked Gil Cabrera that very question because he was left, uh, left off on this mailer. He thinks that uh, the GOP sees Castellanos as more vulnerable because of a sexual harassment lawsuit mm -hmm. that was filed against him and his employer. The Voice did some in, more in-depth reporting on all, all the merits and the details of that case. But regardless of, of whether there's any merit to it at all, uh, you can rest assured that his opponent is going to exploit that to every, uh, you know, uh, to the greatest extent possible, especially here where we have a history with sexual harassment in, uh -huh. in the oh, city. Yeah, and oh, a couple it? things. I think it, it, it is you know, maybe a little inside politics, but the, the, the details are... That mailer was made by the independent committee in support of Hickey, and uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, Ryan Klumpner, uh, is, who's running that campaign, and the spokesperson, Sarah Kamiab, actually said, we wish they hadn't done this. We actually think this is hurting Hickey's ca chances, and we wish they'd stop. Uh, okay. So uh, that's interesting. And I, and I think what, what um, you know, Andrew's mentioned is that, that issue that people expect is going to come out in the general hasn't come out in the primary, and it's kind of an indication that People don't know what city attorney is. People don't know who these people are. There's not that much money to spread around. You don't really have enough money to attack your opponent. You have to spend the money you have just getting your own name ID up yeah. to get you know some amount of votes to, to hopefully be the second you know second most voted. Get the mailers out. And of course, in these races, in the primary, we only have a couple seconds left. There's no polling. We really don't know how any of them are doing at this point. Huh? Nope. So we'll have to. I mean, they have polls, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Knows with us. All right. Well, well, I'll have to find out on Tuesday here. And of course, we do have a complete voters guide. I should plug on kpbs.org where you can get a lot of information on all of these races and issues. We are going to move on. It's certainly an odd election year. That's especially true in the the races for San Diego City Council since the odd numbers among the nine districts are up for election. Incumbents have a big advantage in these races, but there's some intrigue in a few of these districts. So Andy Keats, start with District 1, La Jolla, University City area, bit of nastiness there against the two, uh, shall we say, leading candidates if we can. Yeah, if, so if the city attorney is the race that hasn't gotten negative because there's not enough money, that's just not the case in D1. They've got all the money that they need and they have used it to attack each other relentlessly. Um, it's uh, Barbara Bree, who's a Democrat, uh, versus uh, Ray Ellis, who's a Republican. Uh, the parties are particularly important here because whoever wins will presumably give the deciding vote to whichever party is in control of the city council and therefore elect the city council president who has control of the docket. So a big um, swing district, yeah, that's why. This, yeah. you know, this determines control of the city council. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 main com the main attack line has been that Barbara Bree, uh, by virtue of supporting the citizens plan, this relatively complex system that would raise hotel taxes to facilitate potentially a convention center downtown, that she is uh, de facto supportive of a uh, Chargers Stadium downtown, that Ellis has hit her on that relentlessly. Um, she has said that his attacks are dishonest. Mm -hmm. They She says just not true. You keep repeating it. Huh? Yeah, I mean, and it, it's a pretty esoteric debate if you really want to get into the details of it. Mm -hmm. She has said definitively, I, look, I don't know what to tell you. I don't want public funds to go to a downtown stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, the argument from the Ellis camp and one that was to some small degree conceded by Corey Briggs, author of the initiative, is that there's an indirect subsidy 
if you build with public money a convention center and then use that convention center to reduce the costs of a stadium that is combined at the same facility, that you can't entirely separate those costs. Um, so it, it, it is philosophical, it's indirect, and it's, it's a reasonably difficult thing to parse out. But it, at least from my reading of, of the, the way that bill works, it's not from left field. It's not okay. completely false. Okay. And, and I think that um, beyond all the, the really complex details in the citizens' plan, there has been some mischaracterization of uh, of of what it is exactly. Um, they're uh, both, I think, by the Ellis campaign and also super PACs that are supporting him. They've called in mailers, they've called it Breeze or Barbara's plan as if she was the one who wrote it. Whereas, you know, I think if she had written it, she would have not included this sort of uh, legal pathway for a downtown stadium to be built because she says she doesn't support it. The, the, the plant, she does support the plan. She doesn't necessarily support every single line uh, that's, that's within it, but, you know, she thinks that the good outweighs the bad. It also, you know, a big part of the citizens' plan is, is what is done with the Qualcomm site in Mission Valley. It reserves that for uh, potential expansion of the SDSU campus and parkland. So, you know, I think that um, the, the focus on the stadium and that's what the citizens plan about is a little bit disingenuous. All right. <clears throat> David. It appears like an attack by Ellis and his, his hopes, I think fading hopes, that he can maybe win outright yeah. in June. Absolutely. Because there's three other candidates in the race and it mm -hmm. appears a runoff is likely and it seems like he got aggressive thinking, okay, maybe I can get a, a, a outright win in June, but a, a runoff appears likely to me. I don't know about yeah, you. Yeah, no, it mm -hmm. seems that way. I mean, you go back to January when Joe LaCava got out of the race, there was at one point this was a one-on-one -on -one race. Um, and at that point, it started to look very good for Ellis to win outright in a June electorate that was going to be uh, far less blue than you would get in November. So he's taking his best shot now, mm -hmm. because once you get into November, it's considerably less likely. Right. Well, all right, let's shift a few minutes left here. Let's okay. shift to District 3, includes part of uh, Hillcrest, uh, Balboa Park, part of downtown. Nearly 25 years, it's had an openly gay representative. Uh, is that a per prerequisite? Who's running it? Yeah, I think that's the right, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, the So the, the, there's two Democrats running. One works for Todd Gloria, who's a loyal Democrat favored by the party, and then one works for Marty Block, who's chief of staff. Um, Chris Ward is uh, a, a gay person. Uh, Anthony Bernal is not. Um, I, All Democrats. That is, now, none of these attacks have been explicitly about that. Mm -hmm. um, and what they've mostly been about is that Anthony Bernal took a uh, considerable donation from Doug Manchester, who uh, was the financier of California's uh, ban on gay marriage back in 2008. Um, at this point, you have to ask Anthony Bernal whether that thousand dollars was worth it, because Doug, Doug Manchester and Anthony <laughs> Bernal's face have been on this on mailers together ever since. Uh, the attacks have been relentless, and um, so it's not. It, no one's saying Anthony Bernal. No one. No one is at least explicitly saying Anthony Bernal should not be elected to this district because it is he's a prerequisite that, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that you be gay. Yeah. It's that he's taken money from somebody who is openly and outspokenly opposed to gay people being having the right to get married. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> but with Todd David. Gloria and Kehoe, I mean, it's, there's a long history of that yeah. district being represented. Yeah, for, for many years. There, going there are two other candidates in, in all of the city council races that are also yeah. um, uh, gay. There's um, Georgia Gomez in mm -hmm. District 9 and Kyle Heiskala in District 1. So, you know. That's okay. <laughs> and as long as you mentioned District 9, Ricardo Flores running to replace his boss, Marty Emerald. She's terming out. Uh, his opponents are Dem against, uh, Democrats. Again, some Republicans are, are getting and you know, maneuvering some things in that race. What's behind yeah, that? Yeah, so it's it's in some ways aligns with what's happening in District Three. This is Ricardo Flores is uh, is running, and he's kind of got the the financial support and even the uh, explicit <coughs> support of the center right establishment. Mayor Faulkner, through an IE, was making robocalls on his behalf. Flores says he does, didn't want that and doesn't welcome the support which tells you a little bit about how maybe D9 and D3 are different, that, yeah. that Anthony was happy to have the support and mm -hmm. Ricardo was not. Um, but in, in, that, in that race, you know, on, on the issues, there really isn't much that separates them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go down the checklist, they're, they're very close to each other on a lot of things. So, well, again, we'll have to sort all this out. I should say, Voice of San Diego, you've done a wonderful voter guide as well, so we'll push people to, to that site here. Well, uh, finally, voters on uh, Tuesday are going to be asked to approve a plan to uh, tackle a gigantic problem with crumbling infrastructure. Uh, David, what is Proposition H, and what is it proposed to, uh, how's it going to fund these massive uh, repairs. Well, I think the theory behind it is that the city has been neglectful in the past when they run short of money on infrastructure, and this is a way to force the city to not ever do that again. 
It takes future savings from pensions. Pension payments are supposed to go down. Um, and it also takes future sales tax revenue growth, and it sets that aside over the next 25 years toward infrastructure spending. Okay, so uh, it doesn't raise any new revenue to fix the streets well, and the water mains? And that's and a big complaint, because a lot of folks have wanted the city to do a general obligation bond, which would be an increase in property taxes to, to deal with the infrastructure backlog. That's what Todd Glory and a lot of other folks have been talking about for quite a while. It's just a big separate pool of money to Exactly, to new money. This is actually just uh, cordoning off future revenue increases, that other one would raise new revenue, which some folks think is a better approach than this one. So we should uh, talk about the scope of the problem for a moment here. Uh, how much money, we're talking about some real money here for a city, even a big city like San Diego. It, we are. I mean, the city's capital improvement budget every year is like $300 million, and so you, you look at this, it's a lot more than that. Uh, if, if you look at the independent budget an analysis, they say $1.4 billion, but that's really over the next five years, and that's just a list of the projects coming in the next five years versus the revenue expected in the next five years. And they're still doing facility assessments, exactly. so it's mm -hmm. actually a lot bigger than It's going to be a lot bigger. I, I, I would say four or five billion seems like most people feel pretty comfortable that that's a good What guess. we really need, is what mm -hmm. you're saying, as opposed to just the projects in the pipeline. But, but then uh, other critics will say with sea level rising and concerns we have to do infrastructure to deal with that, that mm -hmm. it could be even bigger. Yeah. Way way off that, yeah. So, we should also... Think, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, I was go just going to say, Andrew? Prop H, you know, for, for uh, the conservatives, I think the big selling point is that there's no tax increase, you know, they're, they're sort of um, uh, stamping it as, you know, we're fixing the infrastructure regardless of their intent. I think that a lot of people are going to see this and say, oh, we're fixing our infrastructure problem without raising taxes. The definition of the infrastructure deficit is we don't have enough money coming in and we're going to need to raise taxes. So, and, and you know, I've, I've hampered a lot of, of supporters of Prop H on this and it, they, they seem to, really unwilling to, to acknowledge the fact that that the infrastructure deficit is really about how much money the city's taking in. Mm -hmm. Well, and it should, we should be perfectly clear that the numbers that, that the Prop H would support, would, would eventually produce, don't become sizable unless you start viewing them in decades. Mm -hmm. It's over a 25-year period that you even get to the point that it's a substantial number. Over the next five years, it doesn't raise anywhere near what the need is, and the need exists Today. Right, and when you're talking about crumbling Steve? infrastructure, mm -hmm. each year that gets worse and worse. And these streets are, are, are frankly, are, are really bad here in San Diego. The amount of steel plates I drive, the amount of potholes. You guys don't even have snow here. And we don't have snow and ice and rock salt exactly. where you and I come from. Well, yeah, yeah and, and to, to, you know, maybe to uh, belabor the point a bit, it's what this would do is slow the rate at which things get worse. It by its own admission, does not make mm -hmm. things better. <clears throat> it makes them get worse more slowly. The other thing is the, the phenomenon that creates the new revenue, the, the, you know, the process by which sales tax receipts will increase, will also affect the need, which will also be subject to inflation and get bigger. Mm -hmm. So yes, budgets grow over time, but that's not free money. Mm -hmm. we, we need more money because the costs get bigger. Right, right. David? And, and, I, and I hear everything you're saying, but despite that, it, it was passed by the city council with some bipartisan support, mm -hmm. and there's no fund in opposition to it. Yeah. Uh, and so it does appear, you can't be sure, you know, likely mm -hmm. to pass. And if you, when you talk to city council people, every time they ask their uh, constituents what's the most important issue, they always say infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing when people see infrastructure on the ballot and there's no new taxes without any opposition, this is probably going to pass. Now, no, that's funded opposition. There are some people who, are against it though, right? There, there are some folks uh, on the ballot, about, yeah. uh, on the ballot, and there, there was some con some concern from Mark Kersey, the councilman who supported this, right. that they list and firefighters, public. nurses, and some other folks as opposed to it. it sort of implies that the that city's a firefighters union and police union are against it, which isn't true. Uh -huh. He thought it was disingenuous on the ballot statement. Uh, uh, though there are that, some concerns uh, that this uh, takes uh, away from pension. I mean, you're trying to hire folks like. 911 sure. operators and the like, mm -hmm. yeah. So retain police officers. Retain police officers, and that some of this pension savings may need to go to hiring future officers well, or, or that, that organized labor have. would oppose it because mm -hmm. it's going to make it harder for city employees to get raises in the future but so far they really haven't. I think mm -hmm. that one of the dangers in this is that uh, you know like I mentioned a lot of people are going to see infrastructure like you said a lot of people are going to see infrastructure new new taxes and they're going to vote for it. Um, San Diego has been building up a lot of momentum towards fixing this infrastructure problem. It's been in the press a lot. We've talked about it a lot. Um, you know, if if at some point, you know, and Mark Kersey himself says this is not going to fix the problem. A lot of the supporters say that as well. It's not the end of the story. But if you, you know, get voters to vote for this and then two years or four years later you have to go back and ask them for new taxes, they're going to think, you know, or at least the argument goes, they're going to think, well, I thought we solved this problem with Prop H. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly mm -hmm. the question is, is, is how do voters react? Because, yeah. you know, the, you'll hear people say sometimes that the tax rubber band is only, is only so elastic. 
And even though this doesn't increase taxes, will it have that same effect of convincing people that something material has been done for the problem when it hasn't? David? And one thing I'll say, of, of everything on the ballot this year, this is probably the thing that's going to matter the most long term. Yeah. You know, we yeah. talk about Prop B from 2012 all the time right now, mm -hmm. the, the one that was pension reform, right? right. This is something four, five, six, seven, eight years from now, that we, when we get into the budget cycle, the first thing people are going to say is, well, how much money is available and how much money has to be taken out because of Prop H? Right. Okay, a couple of seconds left before we have to wrap up. Uh, you think it may, it, just because it's on the ballot, it may pass. It's got a strong chance. Huh? Oh, I'd be shocked if it doesn't pass. Yeah. Uh, really? So uh, we'll Lots have to... Support. We'll have to see. Well, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to leave it there, but we'll urge everybody to follow KPBS and Voice of San Diego and the Union Tribune as we uh, pull together on Tuesday and see where all these uh, races go and where we're headed to uh, for November. That wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Steve Walsh of KPBS News, Andrew Bowen, also of KPBS, Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego, and David Garrick of the San Diego Union Tribune. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable, and be sure to vote on Tuesday.